Hi, I'm here with David Webster from the University of Gloucestershire. I'm Peter Kernan, I'm from Marling School, and we're talking about Buddhism. We're looking at the Four Noble Truths, and we've got the second of the Four Noble Truths, uh, Tana. David, what's Tana? Absolutely, Tana is an interesting word. It's often badly translated as desire, which doesn't do any justice at all. It's often translated as craving, which is a much better translation, one that I'd recommend. It comes from a root um, in the Pali and Sanskrit to do with thirst, and kind of gas kind of gasping, grasping after things. Um, and it is defined in the Four Noble Truths. And the second Noble Truth is the Noble Truth of Samyadaya, the, the truth of the origin of Tana, of Dukkha. So where does suffering come from? What causes us to suffer? Well, actually, Tanha, craving causes us to suffer. But um, as I'm hoping you'll explain in a minute, Buddhism being exceptionally keen on lists, um, probably through these origins is all the literature, that's another story, but Buddhism being very keen on lists identifies three core types of Tana, uh, which are hopefully you're going to enlighten me on. Yes. Now these are helpfully outlined in Keon again, yeah. uh, that he says there is sensual craving, that's what we all understand, we all understand. We know about that. We want yeah. stuff, yeah. 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 And then you have a craving for existence, this craving for ego that you want, craving, for, and then this is an interesting one, craving for non-existence, that is, is also an inappropriate desire. Uh, take us through those three desires, what do you think of those uh, three desires? Uh, as a, well, the as first of those, uh, karma tanha, yeah. um, which is you know, not only, um, we tend to think of uh, sensual desires as only kind of sexual or erotic desires, it definitely includes that, yeah. um, an awful lot to be said in the tradition about that, but also includes desire for cake, yeah. desire for a variety of sensual pleasures um, and the avoidance of displeasures, and you know, to be kind of warm and comfortable, not cold and miserable. Um, Bhavatana, uh, the craving for existence, we're probably quite familiar with this as well, so whenever our feeling of we feel under threat in terms of existential under threat, our existence is under threat, we feel that we want to have a crave to continue existing, to continue beyond death, to, to not be killed by the bus that we're running across the road to avoid. You know, we're familiar with that. And the other, the Bhavatana, the craving for non-existence confuses people. People find that is that just the craving that drives people to suicide? Yeah. Well, it can be that, but it's also the craving to be away from things that we are not drawn towards. A very so if you say the flip side of desire is anti-desire, is hatred, is a desire not, not this, not this, that kind of um, not drawing towards, but pushing against. But it's that same ferocious energy often constituted in Buddhism as on fire. Yeah. Uh, fire, very positive image in Hinduism, becomes a very negative image yes. in Buddhism, and um, for all sorts of historical reasons. Um, but this idea of it dry, the power drives us away from it, rather than pulling us towards it. So Tana is the thirst and grasping, um, as craving, that can pull us to things or drive us from them. But it's just still the same kind of strength of feeling about them. Now, Bodai, in his book, it's online, uh, The Four Noble Truths, it's an old book, uh, he talks about the casual role of craving. He says there's, there's different levels to it. There's a psychological level, a universal level, a cosmic level. Um, what do you understand what he means by about the psychological level of craving? Well, they are probably the level, that's probably the level that most of us are familiar with, craving. Because not, not only is it me um, walking into the university refectory and seeing a Snickers and wanting it and buying it, that's kind of straightforward. Yeah. But it's also all the kind of things that I get driven to suffer by when I'm lying and I'm imagining what I want and I can't get what I want. Yeah. Or I've got what I want and I don't want it anymore. Yeah. Or I want something else. Or I've got what I want and I don't want to lose it. I've suddenly become aware when I achieve my dream and buy myself a Ferrari, yeah. I spend all night worrying that it's being scratched. And then you've because got I've got this kind of deep psychological you've got attachment. This cosmic level where the body wants to be reborn. It, it, it wants to uh, find rebirth, and you get these karmic formations. Uh, Bodhi says is at a deeper level, craving is the force which fuels the round of rebirth, samsara. Tell us a bit about, uh, we're going to come up, come up back to that again, maybe perhaps this cycle of, of rebirth, but tell us a bit about dependent origination and the role of Tana in, in that. Absolutely, and I can preface that by saying, if people want to um, get better marks, but also want to kind of point out something interesting about Buddhist thought, is that what happens at the micro level, the psychological personal level, happens again at the macro cosmic level. So rebirth, 
individual universe is going through these cycles. So the micro level and the macro level match onto each other quite nicely. So we have individual craving. We have this big picture craving as well. Uh, and I think you captured it quite well. You said it is the engine that fuels rebirth. So it is the um, Bhavatana. Yeah. I can't let go of existence. Um, and this drives me, this energy forces the process of rebirth. So when I die, my psychological formations, um, I'd hesitate to call them spiritual in the context yes. of Buddhism for lots of reasons, yes. but the kind of psychological or sort of um, psychic aspects of myself power on, driven by all this, this sort of strength of burning and this on fireness. So um, just broadening it out then, uh, the, is there a Mahayana perspective on desire that is any, any, in any way different to the Theravada? approach to desire and tana. Uh, we think of the fire sermon and, and, and there are certain things that we can pull out that seem to be particularly important for the Mahayana tradition. What, what, what kind of comes to mind for you? Yeah, absolutely. And actually what you find in the development of Buddhism in Mahayana traditions generally, because it's not one tradition but as a, a family that come under this notion of Mahayana, is that conversations about desire become more complicated yeah. about its efficacy um, and can it be used for things and has that a positive value sometimes not always well mahayana is described as kind of buddhism becoming re-hinduized yes. in a certain way and actually hinduism has a lot of positive things to say about desire look at the importance of yes. cosmic desire to lord yes. shiva yes. Um, so actually people, this kind of creeps into buddhism so you find certain, certain tantric forms of buddhism where you can use desire to disenchant yourself with desire. Now, the early Theravada Buddhism says very clearly in a sutra called the Nun Sutta, where a nun seems to be suggesting to Ananda, the Buddha's assistant, that sexual desire can be overcome by having sex. Yes. Um, no, so that's yes, sort of. Um, yeah. He's exceptionally negative about that and says, not quite, step away from me with that kind of idea. Uh, but in Tantric Buddhism, this idea that if you have too much of something, you will see through it, it's like being forced to smoke 20 cigarettes yeah. when you're caught by your parent or whatever, it will make you sick of it, becomes something that underlies some, I think so, some later thought in Buddhism that becomes more nuanced or more open to ideas about desire differently. Yeah, great. Right. Uh, and and for, just uh, broadening out once again to critiques of uh, Buddhism, some might offer here a, a social critique of Buddhism, that their emphasis on um, getting rid of desire leads to a passivity that might perhaps lead to a certain injustice, a wider sense of malaise perhaps in Buddhist societies. How might Buddhists respond to that critique of their faith? It's quite a common critique and you often hear it from people who are very attached to the very powerful social justice movements that have arisen, um, for example, within Christianity or within um, some of the radical movements towards um, equality in Islam. Um, and so in Buddhism there seems to be this very individual yep. notion and it seems to be about not caring. What I think a more nuanced, more sophisticated, a proper kind of understanding of desire in Buddhism is actually Buddhism doesn't condemn desire. It condemns categories. You could, if you were wanting to sound uh, fancy about it in an essay, say there are typologies of desire yes. in Buddhism. And actually the aspirations, absolutely, and the aspiration, the goal to make the world a better place is why the Buddha, in the story of the Buddha's life, he doesn't choose just to go to Nirvana and not tell anybody. He sighs, thinks it's going to be really hard teaching because people are idiots. You know, people won't understand me, it's very frustrating, but he says, I'm going to do it anyway for the benefit of all beings. Yes. And I think the aspiration to be um, a Buddhist, and Buddhist, Buddhism is a missionary religion, the goal of spreading Buddhism is drawn out of a goal that human suffering is a negative thing, sentient beings suffering is a negative thing, and we need to do all we can to stop it. So it might seem like a very passive message, but I think there are threads in Buddhism where social justice movements can find purchase. Thank you very much.